Shalom. Welcome to The Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabad House of Delmar, together with my co-host Mark Ronich of Statewide News Service and jbiztechvalley.com. We have a very, very, very special guest with us, Senator Cecilia Kachik. Uh, the Dwaynesburg, can we say, or there's where Mark will get into it. It's a big area, <laughs> but in any case, Senator, welcome to the Jewish View. Yeah, Thank Senator, you for having it's, me. It's so nice to have you here. This is your first term in the state senate. How are you holding up? Is it more, was it more <laughs> overwhelming? Because I know freshman lawmakers don't get a whole lot of money for staff and don't get a whole lot of help and support. But how are you holding up? How are you I'm, doing? I'm having a great time. I love what I'm doing. I love representing this district. And I love getting out and meeting people and learning so much about the area. This is a new district that was put together uh, in the last uh, term mm -hmm. or the last uh, cycle. So it's a new district, and I'm a new senator, so there's a lot of getting out and meeting people and talking to folks. Getting really to know it. you, yeah. right? Well, just <laughs> tell us the district. Like I was saying, I know you're centered in Dwaynesburg, but tell us the area because it is a big it's area. Five, that, five yeah. counties. Yes, it's the 46th Senate District. It covers all of Montgomery County, the western portion of Schenectady County, which is the towns of Rotterdam, Dwaynesburg, and Princeton, and I live in Dwaynesburg. In Albany, I have Gilderland, New Scotland, and the Hill Towns, all of Greene County, and a large portion of Ulster County. So mm -hmm. my district goes all the way from Montgomery County all the way down to the uh, bridge over the Hudson River, the walkway over the Hudson. So it's a long, long yeah. drive. And, and you are a, you're a former school board member. You, you, know, you were a school board member when you ran. Yes. So you didn't want to stay on the school board and have a district like this. I'm just teasing. No, that. well, it, it, I couldn't do both. Technically, the, Technically they, could. I could have, yeah, but, I, but I decided <laughs> it was not wise. It wasn't wise, no. <laughs> if, especially if you wanted to have that nice smile that you have continue. <laughs> right. But one of the funny stories I like to tell is I, as a school board member, one of the things that I really appreciated was when legislators came to our school board meeting and had conversations with us and talked about what was happening with the school budget and how we were doing, you know, trying to educate the kids. So I committed to going around and meeting all of the school boards in my district. We have 28 school districts wow. in the 46th Senate district serving about 40,000 children. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've got three more to go, and then I'll, I will be able to say that I've gone to every uh, school board meeting at least once. Well, this is like Senator Schumer saying he's visited every county in New York State every year. So it's uh, you can put out a news release and say that you've, like he I does. will be. That's okay. a good, good, good <laughs> suggestion, Mark. Um, but my son uh, yes. had a joke. Well, it wasn't a joke. He, I, I'm often not home in the evening because that's when the meetings are. I said, son, he's 14. I'm, I'm not going to be home tonight. I'm going to a school board meeting. And this was after I got elected. He said, Mom, I thought you got off the school board. <laughs> I said, no, I'm going to everybody else's school board yeah. meetings. <laughs> so do you come back and visit Dwaynesburg for old times' sake? I do. Dwaynesburg I've, school I've board? Yeah. a couple times as a mom. And as a mom. And so education is your passion, and since you were on the school board, I mean, you know, like everybody has their special issues that they want to see passed or their committees. I mean, which committees are you on then? I'm on quite a few. I'm very passionate about education, and, and it's one of the primary reasons why I decided to, to run for the Senate. And I am on an education committee. I'm on children and families, environmental conservation, veterans and homeland security, and I'm ranker on elections, and I'm also ranker on mental health and developmental disabilities. And you're on Can agriculture. And agriculture, yes. I'm, I got it listed here, so I'm Thank keeping... Thank you. Okay. Is you're it you're a, doing it from memory, I'm just not. Just a so. senator <laughs> probably has to do, and I don't know, just even the workings of the of the um, the capital, because there's so many fewer, obviously, senators of people know than assembly people, so really senators have to cover more bases. I mean, yes. you know, it's the same amount of committees equally in assembly, but you have to... Right. No, clearly in the, in the Senate, as a freshman, I'm ranking on two committees. So you're, That means you're the senior she's, member? She's a, in, a Democrat is in the minority, so ranking is what they say to minor, members of the minority party. You're the so lead, the, so instead, you're of the chair, lead. instead of chairperson of yeah. the committee, she's, which, is, which is the person who controls the agenda, she sits at the other end of the table with her Democratic colleagues and 
voices their opinion has give and take more than setting the agenda and having control of what bills. Right. So I'm have. the leader of the minority right. party of, many committees. of the committees. Right. And in the Senate, you're either a ranker or a chair on a committee, even as a freshman. Whereas in the assembly, as you no noted, there's many more members, so it takes a few years before you're in that um, yeah. position. Let me ask you something, because I asked this of all the freshman assemblymen who've been on here too. Mm -hmm. uh, when you were elected, did they tell you that there are certain committees, like rules, that you can't be on? Or they didn't say that. They asked me what committees I preferred to be on. Right. So when they asked for three, and you get, you know, it, it depends, you know, the ones who have seniority and have been around for a while yeah. or are all and, and are already on committees, you know, their preferences are taken into consideration probably before mine. Um, so I, I got, there was one committee I, I requested that I didn't get Which placed was? on, that was housing. Mm -hmm. Because I have um, about 20 years experience working in affordable housing and I worked for the Senate uh, Democrats when they were in the majority as a policy analyst and I on affordable housing so I have a housing uh, mm -hmm. policy background but it, they didn't put me on housing but I, I love the committees I'm on I think it really fits well with my district and the issues that that I've been interested in no I agree uh, it really does I, I was just wondering about the committee on mental health and developmental disabilities uh, why is that so important well, you. I worked for the Supportive Housing Network for several years, and this is a group that uh, represents not-for-profits who do a, a housing with supportive services. And we're housing primarily uh, people who are chronically homeless, so many of them have mental illness or substance abuse issues, and we're helping people get in housing and stay housed, and that's a much more cost-effective and efficient way to deal with homelessness. Oh. People who are chronically homeless and, and have a hard time staying in housing often have mental illness or other issues going on that they need to deal with, and the supportive side of this housing makes sure that they're getting the support that they need. So if you have a mental illness and, and you don't have any family support or otherwise anyone looking out for you and, and you're off your medication and no one's noticing you, uh, oftentimes you don't get help until there's a crisis. This is a way to make sure that you're getting the services and support you need uh, before there's a crisis. So these, the folks they're housing are people who typically have no other alternative or would be on the streets. Do you have a personal story as to why you even got involved in being interested in this topic? Well, because I, my personal story is I'm someone who, who cares about people and when I was growing up, I grew up on a farm, and we also were very poor. I remember when we got indoor plumbing. I mean, we, we didn't have much, and we were, it was a very rural area, so it was very isolated. Where was that? In New Jersey, in Warren County, New Jersey. What I grew town? up on a, a dairy farm, Blairstown. Blairstown, okay. And one of the uh, things that I discovered was how poor we were. We, you know, would go to church, and one year, I was about seven, the, the pastor said, we're going to give a food basket to the poorest family. It was Thanksgiving time. Mm -hmm. And I went home, and it was on my kitchen table. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's, a, that's us. And kids really don't realize. And you, you don't, don't realize, realize you know, well, what does that mean? Us. And then we got it for a few years, and then one year we didn't get it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, okay, well, this is good. We're moving up. You know, we're not <laughs> as poor. We're not the poorest. But then the realization was, to me, there are people who are worse off than mm -hmm. I am. And, and that bothered me at that young age that I wanted to help them. Uh -huh. And that's, you know, so I, I understand uh, growing up without a lot of resources and public education was my normal. That's, mm. you know, was kind of a chaotic childhood, but we had school. So I loved going to school and I saw opportunities that I didn't have, you know, in my home life. I could do something with my future. I didn't have to be poor. Mm -hmm. And that I could work hard, I could go to college, and my teachers really encouraged me to do that. And uh, we had five kids, and my family we were second generation immigrants and from all where? from my mother's side came from Italy my father's side came from Germany okay. so my we lived with my grandparents when we were very young from Germany and spoke mm -hmm. German 
-hmm. And they, uh, so they struggled mm -hmm. to make it here, and they were fleeing, you know, areas that, that they, didn't, they wanted to raise their family in, in this country. So we actually pulled our family out of poverty because their children mm -hmm. went to school and went to college mm -hmm. and got jobs and helped so the whole family. So successful America story. So, and you're yes. still on a farm. You still raise, what, sheep? We or? have sheep now. OK, do you have Jersey cows following you? Or no. No, you didn't do? Because there's something <laughs> called right, Jersey. Mark, there's something right called here. Jersey cows. Know, right. OK, I'm not making right. it up. Yeah, yeah, we still have animals okay. on the farm. So we have sheep now. And sheep. They're a little easier to take care of. I mean, my husband and I both have essentially full-time jobs. and. Uh, and we have a son, so he takes helps us take care of uh, the sheep. You know, one of the issues, like see, education, and Mark and I have many legislators on this Jewish view, and one of the things, obviously, a hot topic is, you know, Common Core that they're talking about. So yeah. many people, they don't like it altogether, or they at least say it has to be tuned up, and just like to hear your opinion well, of she's what. she's not sheepish on this issue. <laughs> Mark, you're, you're going full steam today over here. Go ahead. This is the Jewish view. It's not the comedy <laughs> hour right. over here. You got well, the I wrong show over here. You want to do lively. All right. Okay. Uh, I think it's been very problematic how the Common Core new standards have been rolled out. And I really feel that the schools were not given the time and the resources to really adjust to this new way of, of teaching. We're changing so much in education all at the same time. We're teaching, we're changing how we're teaching the kids, what we're teaching them, and how we're measuring their growth, and how we're evaluating the teachers on whether or not they're effective. And we're putting in place new standards, and then we're immediately testing the kids on the standards and trying to measure all these things. And didn't it's we need to do that? Wasn't there it's, a need? I mean, as a school board member, didn't you see like this thing is falling apart, this system? No. I did not, no. to be honest with you. I did no. not. We have 28 school districts in my right. Senate district. They are all controlled by local citizens, mostly parents. And there was a lot of parent involvement in our school and in most of the other schools in, in my district. We're good schools and or we're great schools. There were, we were not failing our public education system in my, in my mm -hmm. area. And that's why I ran, because I was not happy with what was happening. We were being told, you're not efficient. You're, you're not graduating kids. What do you mean? 90% of our kids graduate or more. If it's 90%, we're like, what, what are we doing wrong? 80% of our kids in my school were going to college of their choosing. So we, and we were affordable. When I compared our school with neighboring schools, we were less costly. And we're not a fancy school. Our kids still bring their chairs into the gym for an, an, an assembly. We don't have an auditorium. We're not fancy, but we have a decent educational program. In Dwaynesburg. In Dwaynesburg. Okay. And we, we, were, we are but, successful. But I grew up in Brooklyn. And I went to a, a school. I went to schools where we had 60 kids enrolled in the class. Only 40 showed up. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, my, my high school, the show Welcome Back Carter was based on my high school. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different environment. I probably had, you know, in the Brooklyn school system, just in Brooklyn alone of the New York City school system, there are probably as many students as in the 28 school districts that you have right. in your district. No, so, we, we definitely have different school systems. That's right. And there's different challenges also. I mean, we, a lot of the kids in my high school were on the six-year plan, mm -hmm. not just the five-year plan. They were still taking algebra in the, in, as a senior or a super senior. So, so could this be the you know. issue over here? So sometimes they say downstate, upstate, but I, we've had the um, superintendent of Albany schools here, and the dropout rate is 50%. So no, you know, you, you're successful, <laughs> but maybe they're looking. I, I don't have an opinion on this. I'm just trying to find out also. I mean, sometimes I say, you know, hey, again, I always say I'm 29 years old, <laughs> but you know, you know, we, we learn our math. We weren't stupid. Right. You know, you right. have to revamp the whole education system. We right. produce many scholars and, and smart people, and they were intelligent kids. So I'm trying to get a grasp on really what they were thinking and, you know, what should be done. There, there clearly are schools that, that have more challenges than my school in meeting the needs of those kids to be successful. And when I look at like the city school of Schenectady, their challenges 
are, are, are much higher than the challenges that, that kids might be portraying in my school district. 80% of the kids in Schenectady are eligible for free and reduced lunch. They're essentially giving kids breakfast and lunch. They give food to everybody at their school because it's, it, there's so many are eligible. You have many more families in poverty in that school system. That poverty is a challenge that the school you know, has to deal with. So we've raised the standard, but we haven't really dealt with the, the, those challenges that those schools have that have higher poverty populations. And they need more resources. What they need more mental health resources. They need more supports in the classroom. They need more adults to work with those kids. They may need you know, summer school. Their children are not coming to school as prepared as the children are coming in my school. So to say, well, we're going to change the standards, and suddenly that's going to make a difference, I think is not reality. Mm -hmm. Reality mm -hmm. has to be, let's look at the real problem. And I see one of the challenges, if we don't talk about what the real problems are that our schools are dealing with, we are not having the right conversations. So what's the problem that your schools in the 28 school districts that you represent, what are the problems with that? Well, the problem facing our schools is we rely more on state aid than wealthy or school districts because we don't have the population size. We don't have enough people to really adequately provide that property tax base. So when we cut state aid to the level that we did in 2009 in response to the Great Recession, it really hurt schools in rural areas and small cities who rely more on state aid. Schools that have a lot of local property base, they were not cut as much and it was easier for them to, to fill those gaps. Mm -hmm. So the challenge to us was we're, we're worried about losing kindergarten when a, a suburban school is worried about losing the third lacrosse team. You know, we're not, and we're cutting real educational programs. Well, you're also worried, you're also implementing a universal <coughs> pre-K when some schools don't have a kindergarten. Right. So and some schools still don't have kindergarten, and so not gonna, every area has universal pre-K. So you'll go, to, you know, so if this, if, every, if what is proposed is implemented, you know, there'll be pre-K for the four-year-olds, but then the five-year-olds will be back home, like, right. or when we, they're five-year-olds. You know, so. We had six schools in the state cut their kindergarten programs last year. So don't you shake your head and just yes. like, I, wh who was thinking of <laughs> This makes know? no sense to me. This is what drives me crazy. So don't you talk to the people on the second floor, the governor's office, like the education advisor to the yes. governor and something? And we, we also have an opportunity to talk to the education commissioner. Oh. And we had the budget hearings, and I spoke up about the needs of kids in, in, in my district. Yeah. And we've also pushed. Do they shake their head? Do they shake their head at you, saying, "Sorry, there's nothing we could do for your 28 schools, and we got all these others to worry about"? Or? Well, I think we're all in this together. Yeah. You know, we have to make sure we're educating all of our kids, no matter where they live, no matter what their background. We want to give kids all the same opportunity to be successful, to make it. Mm -hmm. And if we don't help kids get the education they need to be successful later in life. You know, we're, we're not that society that we, we were when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to have those opportunities uh, for people to be successful and to be able to, to get the education and be prepared for that college and career, no matter what it is. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, of work we need to do in education. Also, with the state aid cuts, we also shifted more of the school budget to property owners. I'll give you an example. In my school district in Dwaynesburg, five years ago, state aid covered 55% of our school budget and property owners covered 45%. That's now flipped. Property right. owners cover 55%, state aid is covering 45%. So and we've you're actually state aid shifted. All over. And the lottery yes. revenue is going up and the lottery was supposed to uh, help with the costs of education, but it seems like it's instead of not in addition to state aid, right. and, and that's a problem, isn't right. it? I mean, we, we, we got duped when we uh, passed the lottery, uh, the constitutional amendment for the lottery. Yeah. So we, we have a lot of work to do. What yeah. I want to see is fair and equitable distribution of funding to our public schools, and that to me is, is a top priority. Okay. And if we have fair distribution, the schools will, will have more of the resources they need to implement the Common Core uh, 
standards. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to go into another hot topic, and that's fracking. Oh, oh and, okay. Uh, <laughs> I really, this is the hot issues over here. Yeah, this she's is on Environmental really. Conservation Committee, so this that's is... Uh, we I mean, <laughs> actually, I have heard, you know, again, so I'm a rabbi, <coughs> I'm not... <laughs> you know, Mark is our political <laughs> expert, he's our newsman, and I'm the rabbi, but you know, obviously I'm a concerned citizen, sure. too. so I want to hear about the, the issues that are out there. But I've heard your name that you're a real big anti-fracker, and um, you know, I've heard that on the radio, my said, oh, this, and I'm going to talk to her, so I might as well talk to the senator and get the... Is that a true label for well, you? Well, I'm, I'm a common sense legislator, right. and I've looked at this issue, and I've been concerned that we don't have the ability to put in the regulations and safety requirements. We need to do this safely, and, and I, I just don't believe it can be done safely. So I am against fracking. And I'll give you an example of what, what I mean. Um, just this week, we had an Environmental Conservation Committee, and I introduced legislation last session to ban the importation of fracking waste from Pennsylvania, where high volume hydraulic fracturing was taking place. Because I learned that those drilling companies in Pennsylvania have to disclose where they're disposing the waste, the drill cuttings, and waste that they're, that's coming out of their wells because of the drilling process that they're using. And some of them were saying, we're taking the waste to New York State, and Where? it's going into landfills in New York State or wastewater Which treatments. Which counties? Well, they're all over the state, mostly the southern, southern tier, tier and western part of the state near Pennsylvania. Right. And I'm like, wait a minute, why are we taking the waste product which also has uh, chemicals in it that we don't know about because the gas industry is exempt from clean water laws, meaning they don't have to disclose what chemicals they're using in the process, and some of them are very dangerous and cause cancer. Um, why are we taking this waste product from this drilling process that we don't allow yet in New York State? And so that's why I did legislation to ban the importation of uh, fracking waste. So. Uh, my bill was not being placed on the Environmental Conservation Committee. We have, as a minority member, we have what they call a motion to consider petition. We get to do th that for three bills. So I picked this bill to move in the Environmental Conservation Committee. We had the committee meeting the other day, and it was on the agenda. Mm -hmm. And it failed on a six to seven vote. All the Republicans voted against it. All the right. Democrats voted for it. Which and is why there's an <laughs> odd number of legislators in every committee, yes. <laughs> so it failed at the committee level, so it won't move forward. And the chairman uh, said, I don't think this is a problem here. Mm -hmm. and, and who's the chairman? Uh, from like Grisanti from Buffalo, Buffalo. Uh, Senator okay. Grisanti. And I was actually surprised at that. Uh, there We had a, a, like 10 support letters from organizations that wanted to see the bill move. To me, it's common sense. If we're not allowing hydraulic fracturing, high volume hydraulic you know, fracturing but, but, to take but, place here in New York, we shouldn't be the dumping ground But for you know it. what's interesting? Here you, it's coming into New York State. Couldn't state police or some other entity prevent it from cro either crossing the border or when it does get- But it's not illegal. But when it does get buried here, couldn't the state take some of those, some of that waste and then identify and do tests on it to identify what's in the waste because the, the oil and gas companies aren't going to tell you, but if you know what's in the waste because it's on New York state land, couldn't, you know, do we, we benefit and try to figure it out and do more testing? We don't have the regulations and laws in place to allow that to happen, essentially. No. We, and we, that's why I don't think we should be doing it. And, but my bill but failed. we take the land through eminent domain and then just... No. No. Okay. <laughs> I mean, these landfills are, are owned by private companies, typically, right. and they get a permit from the DEC to accept a certain amounts of waste, and, you know, if they and have DEC the minimal a, information that right. is required by DEC, and they're uh, accepting it. One of the wastewater facility uh, places in Auburn, there was an article in the Syracuse paper that uh, talked about that they had accepted uh, hydraulic fracturing 
the vertical, not the horizontal, but the vertical from wells in New York State, and they had decided, they had done an engineering study and decided that their system could not handle the chlorides from that process. And that's the wells in New York currently. Mm -hmm. The wells in Pennsylvania, where it's high volume horizontal fracturing, those those I think those chloride volumes are much higher and plus you have to deal with the chemicals because right. of that the fracking process that's occurring there so there's they're potentially uh, more concerning the Can you learn something from the North Dakota and Montana experience where they where the economy out there is booming and there there's no one dying and there's you know all this fracking going on but you know, it seems like, wow, you know, they, you can't, uh, you know, the hotels are all filled up, the homes, there's a boom in the housing, there's, the economy is, you know, the state budget is growing like leaps and bounds, and you don't see people saying, you know, they're, now I know New York's different from North Dakota and Montana in that it's, you know, Well, for rural, one thing, it's very but, rural. Yeah. And we have a lot of water, a lot of underground water, a lot they, of aquifers. Yeah. They, it's... They don't have as much water as, as we do. And the potential for uh, spills. But is there something to learn, something on the positive side? I know that you're anti, but you, you know, I'm sure you balance both sides. Isn't there something to learn to see what the, what's positive about it? And that they're, since they're not having death and destruction out in those northern states? I mean, I'm well, just asking. I look at, I'm I look just... at Pennsylvania because I think Pennsylvania is more like New York, and I did visit mm -hmm. uh, an area that has active fracking going on, and I talked to homeowners, and I, I saw some good and I saw some negative, and I'm frankly, I, I see people who have no recourse but have lost the value on their homes because their water was... Uh, poisoned with methane, and they can't prove that it was because of the f nearby right, fracking. because methane is naturally occurring in water. Well, not in their well. I mean, so if you, I would, I would encourage you to yeah. visit uh, some of these areas in Pennsylvania and see. I also saw farmland that had been productive. Produce farms are now, you know, when you're starting the fracking process, you're losing farmland. Uh, this I'm 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 more interested in economic development that's sustainable and long term. Mm -hmm. I want to see more farming done. I don't want to see farmers have to turn over their lands to fracking because they can't afford to be farmers. Mm -hmm. I think food is more important and making sure our water quality stays good is yeah. is really critical, especially because we have so many areas that rely on I aquifers. Used, and I water. used to work for Water Technology magazine and I never thought cryptosporidium and giardia would be in my vocabulary, but you know, I spent the year writing about you know water purification and, and groundwater and learning all about that. So we I, we have a know. lot of agriculture in this state. <laughs> yes. We have a lot of growing brewery companies yes. who re, who rely on on crystal clear water right. to make beer and mm. and places like Amagong have who is a, a brewery outside of Cooperstown said that they would move if, if wow. we ever got fracking because they want to be sure right. that the water they're using is not a problem. So it adds another sense of uh, of uncertainty. Yeah, I just for me I don't believe we can do it safely in New York and that's why I don't think we should do it and we don't have the political will to put in place the right regulations and laws. So to me, it's it's a non-starter. Mm -hmm. So you're not pushing the uh, NCON commissioner or, or health commissioner to release the report. You like the the delays. Well, I think they. Or? I think the longer they're taking, the more we're going to learn from okay. other places where this is occurring, and the more I think we're going to learn, the more we're going to realize uh, maybe we don't want this to occur. In Can't the state. wait to read that report, and it's been forever you know, coming out, so, anyway. Right. Mark, we're out you. of time, but just, Senator, yeah. thank you very, very much, and you'll be a good citizen over here for us, giving you the hot topics, and you answered well, and we just continue with your good work to, for the people of uh, the New York State, and continue on with good health. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for having me. Thank you for coming.